How is it that we find ourselves surrounded by such complexity, such elegance? The genes of you and me, the genes of you and me, we're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA. Hello, you're listening to DNA Today, a genetics podcast and radio show. I'm your host, Kira Deneen. DNA Today informs you on what's happening in the genetic world. During my broadcast, I educate you, the public, on genetic and health topics through event coverage, news stories, book and movie reviews, and interviews. Guests include genetic counselors, researchers, patient advocates, and professors in the field of genetics. My guest today is Alexander Illy. He is the director of the Genome Cure Organization. He received his Bachelor's of Science from University of Waterloo and is currently a graduate student at Duville College. He's actively participating in genetic research, and he even wrote a book called The Genome Cure, The Future of Medicine for Alzheimer's, Cancer, Diabetes, and More. Alex founded the Genome Cure Organization in 2016 and is enthusiastic about genomic research and its medical implications. The mission of his organization is to push towards finding cures for lots of different diseases through advancements of gene therapy and gene editing. Thanks so much for joining me today, Alex. Thank you for having me. So I want to learn more about Genome Cure Organization. You started this in 2016. How did you start and what's kind of the main focus of your organization? So like you said, the Genome Cure Organization was uh, founded last year in 2016. I think the real inspiration to start it up was while I was in school at Waterloo, we would learn about all these uh, diseases, lots of them incurable, like Alzheimer's or hard to treat, like cancer. That part was really morbid and scary than learning about molecular biology and all the concepts surrounding DNA started to shed some light on how some of these problems could be solved. So it got to a point where you think, wow, if we would really put our heads together and keep working on what we know about DNA and do more research because that's the key. We can really get somewhere in treating these these diseases. So it's a young organization. We're just getting ourselves up and running right now. But we've had this goal from the start, and that's why we want to increase the amount of genetic research going on to tackle these diseases. So how much do we really know about the genetics of these diseases? I was thinking today we're going to talk more about Alzheimer's. What do we really know right now? Right, so when we talk about Alzheimer's, the truth is that we really don't know much. We know that we know the end symptomology, and it's a form of dementia resulting from neurodegeneration. We know that we see beta amyloid plaques form in the brain in Alzheimer's. But what really causes it? We, we've started to identify a number of genes that are associated with the disease, uh, common one being the epsilon-4 allele. The genetic involvement in Alzheimer's is, is very, very complex. It's not a matter of one gene or a mutation in this one gene resulting in Alzheimer's. When looking at Alzheimer's, you have to realize that it's more of a very complex network of genes and genetic elements that interact in a very complex way. This is what makes Alzheimer's very different than diseases like cystic fibrosis, for example, which results from a single point mutation in a single gene. What's more is that this complex genetic network is different from individual to individual. It's definitely very complicated in nature. And you mentioned cystic fibrosis as being one of the diseases that's a little bit more simplistic in terms of the genetic element of it, of it's just one base pair that's different in the 3.2 billion that we have. How are we even going to attempt at really learning the genetics? What kind of process do we need to do to figure out really how much is controlled by elements that may be inherited versus things that happen over our lifetime and acquired? genetic changes. When we talk about heredity strictly, familial Alzheimer's disease, like inherited, has a rate of somewhere under 1% of all Alzheimer's cases. Wow, under 1%? That's like yes. almost nothing. If a parent develops Alzheimer's, there's maybe a 5% risk for the next generation to develop it as well. It's, it's surprising because it seems really low, but when we talk about heredity, we're not looking at the complete genetic influence like I was talking about earlier. We're strictly talking about, uh, heredity-wise, we're talking about what is passed down from the parents to the child in, in one gene, in one allele. So the heredity 
of Alzheimer's is very low, strictly heredity speaking, but genetically speaking, in terms of all the genetic influences and all the genetic elements involved, there's a very high influence of what happens due to genetics. So there's a difference in just what you kind of inherit from your, your parents strictly and how that influences progression or disease or, or if uh, someone has a disease, but there's also other genetic elements to it that go into either disease progression or having the disease. It seems to be really that difference between inherited and also just genetics control a lot more and we kind of don't know a lot. Yes, exactly. That's right. There's all sorts of genes that we all have. It's a matter of knowing their function, understanding what they do and how they contribute to the, the disease itself. So has there been any recent research published about Alzheimer's in the past couple years? In terms of genetics, the most recent would be the continuous discovery of genes that play a role in the disease. Uh, we're always finding uh, so, some new gene that, that has some kind of association or role to play in, in what's going on with the disease. It's a difficult process, but it's it, it's start. We're, we're leading to us where we want to go. You also see a lot of research being published on Alzheimer's symptomology and uh, its progression. In various ways, progression might be slowed. Unfortunately, though, there's nothing at the moment that is truly groundbreaking in terms of a cure for Alzheimer's. And we really want to be pushing for that because there's a lot of people affected by this disease. Do you have any rough estimate of, you know, just how many people, I don't know, either in the world or kind of in different countries that are affected? Yes, there's a lot of people affected. Right now, there's about 5 million Americans diagnosed with Alzheimer's. And by 2050, that number is expected to triple. Wow. So it's a very big deal. Yeah, it's a very big deal in terms of the number of people affected. The vast majority of the people affected are seniors. But early onset Alzheimer's affecting those as young as 40 is also, is also prevalent in, in the population. So is there a difference that we know in terms of early onset versus late onset? Are there certain kind of distinguishing features in each? Or is that still something that we're kind of at a loss for? We are still, like, there's definitely a lot that needs to be learned. But what, what we do see with early onset Alzheimer's, it, it does have a stronger hereditary influence. We have that that we know about early onset Alzheimer's. But then again, it's just it's, it can affect anyone as well. It's it's definitely not as common as uh, regular Alzheimer's you see and you see developing in the senior population. And for the hereditary component, that makes sense because with other diseases, if there is early onset, there typically is more of a inherited component to it. So that kind of makes sense in terms of lots of different diseases. So not just this one. Now you mentioned that you know a lot of people are affected. Is there a certain population that is more affected than others, or is it pretty much across the board? So yes, we have we have the, the senior population, which is which is the most affected. It's really a disease that doesn't really care who you are. Just like we say, cancer doesn't care who you are. It's once you get to that age. Now that the population is aging, being able to live longer. We're starting to see more cases of this disease happening because it's it's something that happens after a while. The neuro, neurodegeneration and all all this all this dementia related stuff happens to the brain later on in life. So it's an age, aging population that's that's mostly affected by Alzheimer's. And with increasing healthcare and, and just quality of healthcare, we're living longer. You know that makes sense that because our lifespan is much longer than it was even a hundred years ago, we're going to start seeing more of these diseases affect our population because now we're starting to have people in their 90s and their hundreds with that progress comes a little bit almost consequences not that we shouldn't be doing all these things but um, kind of more issues pop up with that what is the standard of treatment today for people that do have this disease or is there a certain standard of practice that is taken for people that have this or is it helping them through it it all really depends on the stage of the disease those in the early stages of the disease are still generally functional when it comes to simple day-to-day -day tasks. However, as the disease progresses, patients lose the ability to do things piece by piece. You know, a month ago, they might have been able to eat on their own, and now they need caregiving assistance with that, and they can't do it on their own, so they need a caregiver. Uh, this is the neurodegenerative nature of the majority of dementias. There are also certain medications administered to help with comorbid uh, mood disorders and sleep patterns and things like this. 
so caregiving and, and, and medications that might help with some of the symptoms are one of the standard practices that we apply to patients with Alzheimer's. You mentioned different types of dementia. How does Alzheimer's compare to other types of dementia? Dementia is really an umbrella term we use to classify all these uh, neurodegenerative disorders. And Alzheimer's is the most common form of, of dementia. You, ha- you see it in the, in the older population more generally, as I mentioned earlier. And uh, it's classified the beta amyloid plaques we see upon postmortem inspection in the brain. And we don't know why these are. We, we sort of have an idea why these are there, but we really don't know the, the mechanism of action, why these form how the progress of disease uh, of the disease takes place. So how is your organization trying to change the types of treatments we have and really being able to maybe even find a cure? We want to really get cracking at developing some large-scale research models for solving the genetic puzzle we're dealing with here. Right now, it just seems like there's no hope in terms of a cure with modern medicine. People are in the mindset of thinking that maybe 50 or 100 years from now something will happen, but we want to we want to change that. We want we want to bring the future much closer than that. So, what is the process of researching new treatments? It's it's a long one. It's not like oh, you do it for a couple of years and you know you find something. Um, there's a lot of different stages. Exactly what you see nowadays, like you, you see these clinical trials that generally take five to ten years, and then it's just for one specific medication or one specific type of treatment. What we need is a far more in-depth genetic research plan. We found some genes. Great, that's a that's a start. Now let's take that to the next level. We need to identify absolutely everything involved that is genetically associated. This means screening more and more Alzheimer's patients. Next, we have to establish how these elements interact, forming that complex network I mentioned earlier. What we're going to need is a a lot more interdisciplinary uh, collaboration for this to happen. We're going to need more uh, molecular biologists and geneticists working together with computational biologists. The field of computational biology will have a massive role to play because of how complex Alzheimer's is genetically. Without it, it would be like trying to run a, a Walmart, for example, without cash registers. Like it, it just wouldn't work. Afterwards, uh, we're going to be we're going to have other disciplines working on developing uh, viable delivery methods for for any treatment models that we might come up with. We know that the blood brain barrier is another obstacle we'll have to tackle in getting getting our medicines to the brain and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different people that really need to come together to be able to accomplish this, which is why it's so important to be sharing data and and things of that nature to really be a collaborative society in order to really get to that end point of having better treatments and a cure. But this really costs a lot of money. So how much funding is really required to really undergo something to this level? Yes, it does require an immense amount of funding. Right now, the federal government has increased Alzheimer's research funding to uh, $400 million. This is definitely a good investment, but if we really want to accelerate it, get it here faster, within the next few decades I'm talking about, we're, we're definitely going to need to increase that number. What's really good about investing more is that you're not just investing in Alzheimer's research. When you're doing genetic research, the same basic models have a tendency to be successful, successfully applied to different different diseases as well. Running into treatment progress with one disease can can result in treatment progress with another disease and vice versa. And where is research really taking place right now? Are there a couple different institutions that are really leading the way and trailblazing? Yes, you have the the Alzheimer's Association. They're doing a, a lot of research and they're funding a lot of research, and that's good. Uh, they're, they've started doing a lot of more genetic based research as well, which is which is great because uh, I think that's where we need to go. That's like the the root of the problem for us. Uh, we're we're a young organization, so right now we're we're in the midst of formulating research plans. We have we have a bit of a computational work going on. We're going to need as we move forward is is some more lab space suitable for in vitro and in vivo testing and whether it's through our own facility or through collaboration with uh, universities uh, 
it's likely we'll need multiple venues for different areas of research. That's the important part. We really want to put this idea of interdisciplinary collaboration into practice. And so are there specific institutions and other organizations that you're really um, personally teaming up with in order to come together? So right now we're in talks with the uh, University of Waterloo here in Ontario and Canada. Uh, I myself, I'm doing research at Duval College in Buffalo, New York. So we're in talks right now and hopefully we'll get something positive moving forward. Are there other clinical trials right now that really are looking promising that you're kind of keeping track of and, and seeing as new research comes out of those? You know, there are always new medications being tested. Anyone can look these up online. The problem is that these aren't really meant to be cures. The, the majority of them just aim to slow the progress of the disease. We want to tackle the problem at its source. And simply put, that source is the genetic code. It's the base of everything. It's where it all kind of comes from. Exactly. That's where all the, all the action sources out of. For listeners, how can they get involved with this and really be contributing to finding a cure? We're all prone to developing Alzheimer's, so it's not something we should just brush off. And I'm 25 years old myself, and although I have a ways to go before reaching my 60s, and I don't want to just watch and wait for someone else to do something. Uh, my advice is really don't just hope for something to pop up. We need to work together on this. What you can do is donate to research, educate yourself, maybe even get involved with research yourself. As a graduate student in research, can you kind of give any advice to listeners that are currently uh, students and kind of wanting to get in that, but they're kind of, you know, not sure how they can start that research career track? When you're in school, when you're at a, at a university or college or, or whatever, your, your department always has, a, has professors, right? And these professors did research themselves, and you can always just talk to them. That's how, that's how it worked out for me. I did talk to them, and they enjoy talking about science and uh, new research and all this stuff. It's, I mean, that's their job. That's their passion. That's their career. So talking to people really helps. They can help direct you in the right direction if you want to pursue a path in a career path in research or something like that. Which is very exciting to get into, and nothing is ever dull. You're, you're looking for a cure. How more exciting can uh, you get in science? Exactly, right? There's, there's nothing more exciting than having that, that sort of comfort of knowing that we're not going to just have to deal with something as tragic as, as Alzheimer's or cancer, or these devastating diseases that affect so many people today. Yes, something to really motivate those to get into STEM fields and everything. So I highly suggest that as well, being a, a STEM girl myself. That about wraps up today's episode of DNA Today. I want to thank you so much, Alex, for educating us about Alzheimer's disease and, and about how your organization is really kind of becoming a trailblazer and impacting research and development on this. Thank you for having me, Kira. And for people that want to learn more, um, they can go to genomecure.org and also they're on Instagram at genome.cure.organization. If you want to learn more about the show, you can go to dnapodcast.com. Very active on Twitter at DNA Podcast. And I also recently started an Instagram to join Alex over there. And that's at DNA Radio. Questions for either me or Alex can be sent to info at dnapodcast.com. And I'll forward those to Alex that are uh, above my level of knowledge about these diseases and everything. Thanks for listening. And you can join me next week to learn and discover new advances in the world of genetics. We're all made of DNA. We're all made of the same chemical DNA.